Welcome everyone to our edition of the Miss Education of the American. I am really excited today to be joined by my friend extraordinaire, Dominica Washington, as we talk today about Black women. And just for such a time as this, there's so much going on in the world surrounding Black women, and there's no person better to talk about that with than Dominica. So thank you so thank much. You thank for you for joining me. And so Dominica, first I want you to tell everyone about your organization. She and your the vision that you have for young black female identifying. Yeah, for sure. Um okay, so I'm sorry, the identifying piece. Um well, yeah, I didn't so, want to say, I'm no. trying to that intersectionality, right? No, it's great. Um, I, I'd like to speak on that really quickly, though, in terms of she, we take gender nonconforming, um, you know, girls as well. So we work with all of them. So I, I definitely appreciate And I knew that. you would. Oh, girl, we don't turn nobody away. <laughs> uh -huh. you, you need, the, especially because if they come to us, they you know they're seeking knowledge i just can't turn away a child that's seeking growth and knowledge you know absolutely it's not in me to do it but i'm dominica um executive director and co-founder of she chicago uh she is an acronym for strong humble and empowered um those are the pillars um that is the foundation of our organization we focus on nine essential character traits um over the course of a year we chose the number nine because the school year is about 10 months long and we use the first month for induction uh, for new she sisters to come in so after that each month they focus on a different trait we provide um, a community service opportunity obviously character education and um, we also provide college and career readiness supports to girls who are members of the organization um, you know our mission is to provide those three things in hopes of you know, just really cultivating leadership in minority women. Um, oftentimes, when you really look around with preparation or without preparation, minority women are the pillars of their communities. Um, they're the mothers, they're the teachers, they are the providers in a lot of cases for a number of reasons. Um, you know, and we want to make sure that we equip young women with the, tool, with the tools, the skill set, and the moral consciousness to be able to push forward with that legacy alongside the men in their community. So that's pretty much um, well, you're speaking to the ancestors, girl. Girl, look, they with us. They with us for real right now. Um, so what made you, you know, want to start the organization? Yeah. So, um, well, one, I love kids. Um, I really do. Like I was talking about before, like they're just a part of my calling. It's a part of my messaging from God. Um, it's something that I was happy to decode with my co-founder, Dominique Briggs. Um, on a road trip to Detroit. Uh, both of us were teaching at Epic Academy and we were both um, approached about creating like a young women's club for the school because at the time the school just had a young men's club. And we both were just like, well, first of all, why didn't they approach us together? Because we're happy to do it as a team. But second off, um, we didn't want to build an organization I, well, we didn't want to create something that was only for the school that would only reach the students who were there. So we talked about it we hashed it out on the road trip it's about four hour drive to detroit and we just kind of shopped ideas around dominique um had an experience where a young lady you know sent nudes to somebody and you know it really caused her to question the way that young girls are interpreting their identity and their value and their worth and so she felt a strong calling to engage teen girls on the premises of mental health health and beauty, um, you know, and learning to value themselves from the inside out. Um, where me, on the other hand, I noticed in my experience teaching a deficit in understanding themselves in relation to society and understanding their place in the world. And so that's what made me think more about social and self-awareness. So we took those two components and we just kind of merged them together. Like we can have a segment on this and a segment on that and we could just bring girls in and structure it. We came up honestly with the nine character traits because I was visiting my little brother who was who is currently incarcerated. Um, and I was visiting him three, three and a half, almost four years ago in Evansville, Indiana. It was uh, by far one of the most devastating experiences of my life. Watching my brother go to jail was worse than getting a divorce for me. Mm. Um, 
And I was getting ready. And honestly, divine energy, because Dominique and I had decided on the name, but we didn't know what the organization would be composed of, you know, like, okay, so now we got this. And how do we teach these things? How do we teach people to be strong? How do we teach girls to be humble? How do we teach them to be empowered and all of that? And honestly, I was getting ready and just divinity was just like, hey, Dominica, why don't you look at the fruits of the spirit? Okay. Oh, wow. So I realized that everybody's not religious, um, but love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control are something that we can all use, no matter what you, <laughs> you know, no matter what you believe in. Those yeah. are universal things that every single person can use embedded in their psyche it would make the world a much better place if we were all well grounded there so um i shot the idea by my partner like hey why don't we use the fruits of the spirit it's perfectly aligned with the school year and she gave no pushback she was just like heck yeah let's do it we changed faithfulness to integrity um because of the religious connotation and we don't want people to feel like they can't be who they are religiously or spiritually when they're with us and so we changed faithfulness to integrity and we built out a curriculum and boom here we are so i just out in following you i saw that she also has a new branch which is a publishing branch that i was like really excited about so can you mm -hmm. talk to us just about that for a little bit yeah for sure so um the publishing piece is something that me and my partner are still like talking about. Um, I'm in a mode of manifestation. So I use words, uh, speaking and writing to bring things to life. And so um, I just put the idea out there about uh, She Chicago Publishing Company. And, um, you know, one thing is that my partner and I have very different skill sets. So we have different ideas for personal businesses. And I figured, why don't we just build out from what we already have? So we'll have like our own little deaf jam, right? You know, like where they got deaf comedy jam, deaf poetry jam, fat farm, baby fat, whatever else. Exactly. They all come under this one huge brand. And so um, I shot the idea by my partner and she's definitely interested. Uh, what catalyzed it is that I am writing a children's book series. Um, character education as we teach it is geared toward high school students, um, you know, but I have littles at home and character education was a huge part of my own upbringing. So the children's book series will target kids between kindergarten and fourth grade. And it will use two little girls, Cairo and Zoe. Cairo is my daughter, Zoe is my niece. And it will take them on many adventures through their lives that lead them to certain character-based lessons. So at the end of every book, you'll see like a moral that's grounded in character education and small children will be able to follow those kids through, you know, issues that little kids have, not sharing, being disobedient or <laughs> being impatient or whatever the case may be. They'll be able to follow Cairo and Zoe through the stories and see how they reach these conclusions. So it's, it's more intended to support parents in, you know, character education for their kids starting very young. And um, yeah, the, um, illustrator on Fiverr or Fiverr, however you're supposed to say it. And she's been magnificent and we're just building out from there. So the first productions from uh, the publishing company will be um, my book series. And hopefully I could form like a long-term partnership with the current illustrator. She's really bought into the book series. She wants to be a part of it. And ideally in my wildest dreams, it would legit be you know, some place that Black writers can come to, to have, you know, um, great editors and great publishers that can bring their visions to life through literature. Does Ramsey get to make, Ramsey's get to make a guest appearance? And down there, every book, girl. So like, <laughs> every book, Ramsey shows up somewhere, you know, um, you know, he's not going anywhere. Ramsey's is so chill. He's like, hey, I don't have to be in the book. Um, I think I want to do, once it gets out there as a part of promotion, I like to do like a, maybe a, you know, podcast or something like that with him reading the book. Oh. Um, and so he'll do like read alouds with the yes. book type of thing. Yeah. Um, and then we'll like put that out for like kids to engage with and stuff. One of the things I love about you, Dominica, is that you get an idea and you don't stop until it's, you Thank see you. it all the way through. So, so many people like will have an idea, will get a seed, and then 
not water that seed and not nurture that seed. And so like you are just an example in that way of just like making sure that seed produces and produces not just for you, but produces for other people because that's not, that book series waters you, but it also waters mm-hmm. so many others. So I so appreciate that. Thank you so that much. About you. Girl, that's God. I'd be scared. I'd be scared <laughs> that if, I, for real, when he say go, that's when I go. When he say slow down, that's when I slow down. I feel like if I don't move on what he reveals to me, um, you know, I dig myself into a hole and my biggest fear is not being free. And I think you create captivity for yourself when you don't follow that messaging from, you know, whoever your higher power is. Well, that's interesting. I wrote a blog probably a couple of years ago and the post was God is a Black woman because Mm -hmm. we seem to hold these omnipresent, omnipotent, superhuman qualities. Mm -hmm. Like we've nursed other people's babies. We've cooked other people's food and cleaned other people's homes. And yet, Dominica, we are still seen as less than. So there's been a lot. I know there was the National Day of of the Woman, and there was all this talk going about about how much less we get paid and Mm -hmm. um, the opportunities that we don't get. And that's just for women in general. But then we look at societally about Black women. And why do you think Black women are so disenfranchised in society? Um, Well, you know, I think that society treats Black women the way that they uh, treat the earth, you know. Um, I, as I grow spiritually, the more connected to nature and my surroundings I become. And the more at peace I feel, like I can feel the wind carry me. Um, I like meditating in the rain because I like the fact that there's no filtration system between me and, you know, just hydration of the mind and everything and body from God. And I think that, um, you know, society, like I said, we treat Black women the way that we treat the earth. We use it for all of its resources. We try to exhaust it. Uh, We use it until we can't use it no more. And not realizing that no matter how much you take from it, it will self, you know, it will self generate. Mm -hmm. It's gonna grow again, it's gonna come back. And if all else fails, the black woman will survive. If all else fails, the earth will survive and we will grow again and we will produce again. I think that it's a mixture of, you know, ingratitude um, along with fear and envy, jealousy fuels it, Um, feeling like if they stifle us enough within the version of the world that they've created, that we won't self-populate, that we won't regenerate, that we won't reproduce and just grow on our own again. And, you know, as they've seen, at least as, as we hope that they've seen, it doesn't matter. You know, um, the resilience of the black woman is at one with the universe. It's so it's nothing that human beings can do to control that. I think as a black woman, I had to step away from even wanting it. <laughs> you know, like, do I even want so much to be at one with certain constructs, so certain social constructs around salary and things like that? Do I even want to be at one with those things? What part of my godliness would I lose by overindulging in that? Mm. Um, And so if I'm being 100% honest, you know, I guess I could give like a more, you know, grounded answer around like, you know, these systems are designed for blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it's the ultimate envy. I feel like if the devil can get rid of anybody on the planet, he will take us first. And the opportunity that they saw was our men and it manifests as it does with our men. I won't go into that conversation. I'll let a man have that. But, you know, even in their distraction, if you will, from their own divinity, black women have proven that we will rise no matter what. And we'll always be at the height of their fears until they learn to accept the God in us and until they learn to accept who we are as a whole. So that's a beautiful, I love that metaphor that we're treated as the earth. And you said something that really spoke to me. You said, you're not even sure that that's what you want. So talk Mm -hmm. to me about like coming to grips with, you know, like this is what society says I should be striving for and yet coming to grips with, wait a minute, what do I want? 
Mm-hmm. Man, um, I actually just had, this is amazing. I just had this conversation with uh, someone really close to me last night. Um, because hmm. we're told we're we're told that there are certain things that we're supposed to strive for and uh-huh. they're just like monikers that we need to meet and i'm trying to like put this together without going too crazy here or sounding too crazy but i'll just go and you know whatever we use we use but um i just posted on social media a scripture that um really resonates for me um jeremiah 29 11 um, you know, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. And at my lowest point, that scripture has pushed me through so much, you know, um, and it's gotten me to a point recently. I won't say that I've always been this way, but recently I've evolved to the point where I'm like, do I even want this stuff? Because when I examine plans, prosperity, um, hope, and futures, when I really look at that and I try to look at it through the lens of God and not necessarily the lens of human beings, none of this stuff really aligns with it. You know, I think that so much of that stuff, prosperity is so metaphysical, like prosperity is such a spiritual thing, you know, like that there's no way that it can be quantified by the means of this earth. And like one thing that I do have um, that I believe my mom instilled in me is a really strong desire for my life to be a testament to what the universe sent me here to do. And when I get lost trying to, you know, run in the rat race or, you know, trying to network with superficial people or like, I'm so bad at networking, like, they'd be like, how's the weather up there? And I'm like, you know, the weather is a mixture of like, (laughs) like completely lose it, right? And, you know, while I value certain levels of knowledge, you know, that we get here, I think what made me depart from the longing of earthly gain is that ongoing desire to just be who I am designed to be. Um, I get so much fulfillment when I'm doing work for she. I'm do- I get so much fulfillment when I get to have conversations around equity, um, you know, for children. And all of those things are aligned with who I am in a divine space. You know, if I shed all of these clothes, if I shed my ego, if I shed everything, all of these things are critically aligned to what I believe is God's purpose for me. And so then begs the question, well, how did you find your purpose? And for me, um, my purpose has been revealed to me on several occasions over the course of my life. I think the earliest um, revelation was at nine years old. You know, um, I had some spiritual encounters at that age. Um, And then I also had like, you know, responsibilities that were, you know, assigned to me by my mother, but also assigned to me just divinely. Um, And I determined those by the friendships and the role that I play in my my closest friendships. And um, at that point, I would not have been able to name things. But that's the first recollection of when God said to me, this is the way that I'm taking you. Um, it occurred again at 15 years old and I thought I was going to hell and (laughs) like losing my mind. All teenagers Uh, should feel that way, Dominica. Girl, oh my God, because I was made out to just be this horrible child, not in my mom's home, um, but my family had went through some transitions and transitioning to a home where the adults there did not understand me or the upbringing that I come through, through my mom. It was like, uh... It was just, it was extremely confusing spiritually. Um, being in a household where people use church as a punishment. Yeah. Or, you know, you need to read the Bible. You need Jesus. You only need Jesus when you're doing wrong, right? You, you don't need Jesus any other time, though. And it just caused so many conflicting messages. And at 15 years old, I was uh, sneaking to the library on 95th and Halstead. Um, and while certain people thought I was like running the streets being fast, girl, I was sitting there trying to read everything about every religion that I possibly could to try to find my footing again. And what's the library, y'all? Girl. And again, God revealed to me what direction he was taking me in. Um, Again, at 17, again, at 19 years old, again, at 21, and again, at 32, you know. So I hear in that I hear like I go back to that metaphor 
of being treated as the earth. And if, and if black women are the earth, and I love that metaphor, then it isn't about gaining things. It's about giving things. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to gain because the earth gives. Yeah. Earth produces. Come on. So you are producing mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And so with that, though, comes this weight, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a weight that comes with having yes, to do. produce and give and think about thinking about black women worrying about our men like I heard you just talk about your brother and how like mm -hmm. that was a dark time and the weight of ha of all of that and being concerned with them and taking care of the world so yeah. um do you think that being a black woman has been both a badge and a burden to some extent mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, like scriptures that talk about like your steps being ordered and, you know, several amazing people um, on any spiritual pathway that heard the calling, knew the calling and was like, no, like, you know, I just can't. It's a bit much. Um, I definitely experienced that as a black woman. I think the most uh, paradoxical experience that I had was when I found out I was having a son um you know five months into pregnancy I'm geeked you know I'm like oh I'm gonna have me a baby you know and when he flipped his little butt over on that ultrasound and they were like it's a boy it was simultaneously the most amazing and terrifying experience that I ever had emotionally and I remember crying in the car with his dad, just like hysterical because I was so happy, but I was so afraid, um, you know, and I think that the media has shown why a black mother may feel that way. Um, I found more comfort in having a daughter um, because I felt like I could control that experience to a certain degree where with my son, I realized that no matter what good I cultivate in him that his skin color and masculinity will precede him in the world um, once he leaves my home. And so um, when I think about whether the experience of a black woman is both a blessing and a burden, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that the, the tough part is allowing yourself, you know, feeding your crop as much as possible. The part of the world that you're meant to serve giving as much to that as you can, uh, exhaust it, get rid of it, let the energy go. And when it's time to chill, chill, because that's where you recuperate. That's where you go back to being at one with God. That's where you learn your next steps. That's where, you know, you, you refuel to re-engage and to give again. And I think that one of the things that make the experience of a Black woman burdensome is that it feels like the giving never takes a break. Mm -hmm. that the taking never takes a break mm -hmm. you know um back to the you know black women is the earth idea when we went on quarantine even stores like walmart had better produce because what nobody taking from the earth for a little while we yeah. were leaving it alone we were letting it grow you show up in stores that you wouldn't even shop for produce in and the cucumbers are beautiful <laughs> you know the cilantro ain't all wilted and raggedy or whatever the case may be because people left it alone and allowed the earth to have enough time to really cultivate the best of what it could. And I think that Black women, you know, have been so conditioned to never stop giving that we feel bad when we take that time to just be like, listen, I gotta, I gotta get it back. I need to regroup. You know what I'm saying? We, get, we feel bad when we take the time, I don't even need the energy to come back to me from the people that I've given it to, but I do need the space to reconnect spiritually so that I can give again. And because we're constantly treated like cattle, because we're constantly treated like machinery, because we're constantly treated like just things that are just supposed to work for the benefit of others, you know, we we don't take that time that we need. So can you talk to people? So for some people that don't understand that concept, what do you mean by we're treated like cattle? We're treated like um, we're just um, a means to an end. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, you know, America thinks that it designed us, you know, um, 
America uses slavery, reconstruction, you know, the, the HBCUs that were supposedly gifted to us by Freedmen's Bureaus and so on, like Black people weren't teaching before the building got there. You know, um, America likes to think that it gifted Black existence to Black people, particularly Black women. And because it likes to think that it engages us the same way that it engages the other things that they've created or produced. So you know, so it's yes, still you are still a piece of pride. You are yet another, you know, cotton gin, even though a black man designed that, a black man created the cotton gin. You are still another computer. You are still another vacuum cleaner to be used at my disposal whenever I need you to, and you don't get the opportunity to process and to regroup so that you can function at your highest level. You know, uh, we're treated as things that depreciate in value. You know, I'm gonna drive this car. One of the songs I hate the most, one of the artists that I hate the most, R. Kelly, you remind me of my Jeep. And I'm like, I can't believe that women were okay with that. Yep. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna drive this thing until I can't no more. I'm gonna dispose of it. And then I'm gonna go and take the next one. And so that is what I mean, you know, when I talk about being treated, you know, as machinery. The great thing though, is that like the earth will take back its power through a hurricane, a tornado, or a, you know, rainstorm, or a <laughs> pandemic, <laughs> you know, like, just like the earth will take back its opportunity to recuperate so that it can keep being what God designed it to be, Black women need to take that opportunity back. You know, we are not, we need to take that opportunity, you need to take them vacation days, they are on the because you earn them you know we we need to stop feeling bad about mental health days we need to stop feeling bad about compassion fatigue you know i mean sometimes i get to a point where i'm like listen what you gonna do <laughs> you know like okay we have talked about this 30 times now so what you going well you're not nurturing enough you're not everybody needs us everybody mm -hmm. needs us and i feel like to a certain extent when i don't give or I don't produce, then I'm letting so many people down. Mm -hmm. The guilt complex. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, like, I feel the weight and the responsibility of mm -hmm. so much. So to say no, to take that vacation day, to not be perfect in my speech, to mm -hmm. not be... Um, to not be lifting as I climb all the time. Ooh, and, that part it's not, it's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. You're right. That's also harmful, right? And so, and, mm -hmm. and then by doing that, I am communicating to other young women that you can't take a break. Mm -hmm. And, I know and honestly, that's been communicated to us for generations. We got to work four times as hard. We got to, you know, whatever the case may be. And, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the areas that I think, I wouldn't say that we dropped the ball, um, when it comes to self-care, but that we don't realize how harmful it can be is rationalizing our humanity by the standards of white people. You know, a lot of times I hear black women say things like, well, white women are allowed to cry. Well, you know, white women are allowed to be, you know, mentally fatigued, or you don't define, you don't humanize me on basis of yes. people, yes. you know, who have historically oppressed me. Like my value and, you know, my womanhood, my humanity is not necessarily defined by anybody else's existence. Or contention on anybody. All, yes. All I need you to do is be compassionate. That's it. But my humanity is on me. You know, define my worth in humanity by who I am. Not, and not by something that society told you that I am. And also not by something that society told you that you are. I shouldn't have to say, well, you know, you know, well, white women, you know, if white women are able to, then I should be able to. No, I should be able to because I'm me, <laughs> you know, and it, and it gets to a point uh, recently, you said something about, you know, not being perfect in your speech and, you know, how it can go from something that minor, you know, to something huge like work output um, when you're on the job or something. And I recently, um, shit, I just stopped code switching. Once I realized how bad I was at um, networking, I don't have anything to say if I can't speak the way that I speak. 
you know, like in so many ways, I understand academic language versus, you know, whatever else. I also understand standards of professionalism. And even to that effect, I'm like, I mean, well, what the hell is that? Because I've heard white men drop the F-bomb a million times in a meeting, you know, so where is their professionalism, you know? Um, but when it comes to like those kinds of social constructs, I ain't gonna lie, I just drop them. Well, like, that's and it's- liberation, right? That's liberation. Man, and it's hard, I'm not gonna lie. It's hard, it's uncomfortable. Um, it's silencing to some extent, um, you know, but I've gotten to a point where if I can't fully be who I am in an environment, I'm going to depart from it. Um, if I, you know, you don't get to hear, you don't get to steal my ideas. No, can you say that again? You said you're going to depart from it. Say that again. Say yeah. That. If, if I'm not able to be who I fully am in an environment, I'm going to depart from it. I don't need to be here then. Wow, that was. You don't get to pick and choose what part of me you want. You don't get to. Well, I want this, but I don't want that. You know, it, it's it's just not okay. And you know, like I said, it's tough and and it's it can be worrisome. You know, because it's like you know, what else am I sacrificing with this? You know, but at the end of the day, what you're sacrificing for me is just not. Yeah, you're exactly. Part of yourself in order to project something that is not fully authentically you. And you can be the best black person and still be rejected. You know, the best black person, you know, by their standards and still be rejected. You know, I, I see so many um, black men, you know, who have assimilated to, you know, just a really extensive degree. And uh, one of them in particular has come to me, like we've been friends for a while, but we changed, we've grown, we've evolved. And um, he was like, you know, I talk to you because I can just be when I'm talking to you, you know, and I got my thoughts on it, you know, but fine, that'd be, that'd be fine. You can have that. It's cool. You know what I'm saying? But my thing is you chose to commit to a life of falsehood. You chose to commit to a life where you constantly have to live inside of something that is just not you, as opposed to being also valued for who you are. In you, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. Like to make exactly. a home base um, for your entire being, it's not fair. Meanwhile, I'm not good enough for you to marry. Meanwhile, you know, not that I want to marry him, you know what I'm saying? But this, this is just the experience, yeah. you know? Meanwhile, you know, you go home to your lily white wife or your whitewashed black wife or whatever the case may be, but I'm the one that keep you real. No, you, you don't get to do that. You know what I'm saying? It's so, um, you know, it's interesting, but like for me, girl, I just stopped. I stopped conforming when it comes to hair. I think we all did a while back, just like, you know what, this is what it looked like, right? <laughs> this, this has going to be you know, um, I stopped, you know, slouching around white women, you know, because they have, you know, a different type of posture. Um, and I, I've noticed I've watched black women shrink in the presence of white women, not because they're afraid of them or anything, but for that white woman's comfortability, you well, know. I, and there's this, this, there's this element that I came to the realization of um, last year, I was at a conference and I found myself always being the one to walk around people like it's like mm -hmm. my presence wasn't valid like yeah. I, I would be walking the hall and trying to get from one part of the conference center to another and people just wouldn't move Dominica and it was like mm -hmm. for me it was like like I wasn't good enough to move for and so yes. I really came to this conclusion like wait a minute you don't even value my space sometimes mm -hmm. so I found like like when I am in spaces with um white women and white men like I have I, I agree I put my shoulders back and I'm like no I'm going to command the space and I'm not going to move because I want you to accept accept and acknowledge the space that I'm in and I want you to make room for me it was you just know let's let's talk about that space piece a little I was just talking to my mother about this um you know I think it's subconscious for them Absolutely. To, to, and not, and this is not an excuse, but it's subconscious to them. Oof. I'm going to just say it, say that however they want. It's subconscious to invade any area that they are in or a part of. Even the world has existed the for them, Dominica. Even including your personal space. Something that irritated the heck out of me, uh, transitioning to working more with white people. And like I said, I think it's subconscious. I don't think, I don't think that they think about it when they do it. 
but they get offended when you react and it's like no back up but they talk to you like this close to you and i don't know you my closest friends don't talk this close to me you know so you know they you know hi da, 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 and i and like i don't think that they really mean any harm per se but i think it's so subconscious to dominate the space that they are in that they will literally step into your personal space and feel some type of way when you react you know like it's gotten to a point where i mean at one point it's like they can be talking and i'm like this because i need to see you i gotta see your eyes i need to see your expressions and i can't when you like this you know we down there breathing the same air like you yeah. know like back up a little bit they you know in meetings it can be i i kid you not i've like done little social experiments in my head but like in meetings on the train wherever you could be sitting it's a million seats around you and they will take the seat closest to you and it's like like you said well one there's a courtesy but two you don't even respect my personal space yeah how do i regain control over that without pushing you back you know without back up off me a little bit and how do you learn to respect back up off me a little bit as opposed to being offended because i'm not stepping into your space like that right i'm not stepping into your insanity your sanity at the same degree do you think there's you some know? history behind that? So I think when I, you just, and even us, us, us talking about it, I think that history teacher in me is coming out and thinking mm -hmm. about just like, you know, the white, and, and the, the founding of this nation. So the founding of this nation is you are property, I own you. And so whatever space you're in is my is space. My space. Mm -hmm. And so I, so my, your space is not, and so that's for them. But then for us, we haven't been allowed to exist in our own space. So for mm -hmm. us, that is a trigger. Like that is a trigger. I need my space. And we know mm -hmm. that trauma goes down through DNA. So yes. even if I am two generations past slavery, some of that trauma still exists in me. So when mm -hmm. you are invading my space, I feel some type of way about that. I feel attacked. That, Yes, that is the thing that I own. Like you're coming mm -hmm. into it and I need you to back up because I feel threatened by that. Mm -hmm. And I and I want people to understand that that's like that is that that's the heart that's like the microcosm of it all. Like that's the minuscule piece of it. And so when you're saying please move back, I'm not jumping bad at you. I'm telling you like my body is having a reaction and it's yes. And it's like all it's all I got you know what i'm saying like it's all that i have um you know like being a person with a chronic illness um and you know learning my own mechanisms to overcome it a part of me has had to even tell this condition like hey this body at the end of the day is all i got you cannot have it you know and when it comes to race relations i think that it's entirely like just under examined under appreciated um and just misunderstood the trauma of the last thing you have belonging to somebody else of being conditioned to believe that if we took all of this off if we got rid of everything my body is it yes and yes. so then you create this kind of transcendency through your soul you know and you see like the evolution of african-american religion over time and this heart mind soul binding to divinity because the very last thing that we have ain't ours yeah. you know and i don't think that you know it's anything that people are really willing to engage because <clears throat> we'd also have to account for well white people have to own the post-traumatic impact of slavery on them as well and they don't like to think of themselves as victims Let's see. No, Dominica, let me ask you this, because I could see some people listening to this and saying, well, why is it us against, why is, why is there this black versus white? It seems like you're perpetuating that even with the terminology they and us. And so um, can you speak to that idea that some people might have as they listen to us talk? I'm sorry, repeat the question at the end. So thinking about like, uh, like people might listen to this and say like, ooh, even in our language, we're saying they, and we're saying us, and, mm -hmm. they, and, and the thought process that that language necessitates a divide, and then yeah. creating a divide that 
um, now that doesn't have to exist. And mm -hmm. so what do you think about people that might think that way or have that, to, have that ideology as they listen? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's beautiful ideology to have. Um, I think that it's the foundation. It can be a part of the foundation for facilitating the unity that they want to see. But I also think that, um, I think that to get there, there has to be the conversation of the divide. Like we're, we're not gonna reach that peace if we can't have this discussion openly. Historically, you know, they, um, they, they, they rectify things by sweeping them under the rug or just ignoring that they exist. And anybody that grew up with old black women, you know, what's the devil's greatest trick? Convincing people that, it, that he doesn't exist. Exactly. And at the end of the day, if we don't have these discussions openly, if we don't confront our demons as a nation, if we don't confront our demons as individuals, then we're never going to reach that true uh, unity that they, us, that we claim that we want to see. We can't silence certain conversations, uh, you know. Or to me, my identity. So I identify as a Black woman and I'm very proud for us. Mm -hmm. I'm very yes. proud to be part of us. Dominica. Yes. And I've been using this lately. Like when we sweep things under the rug, what happens? We have a massive mess of trash mm -hmm. rug that's going to eventually hurt somebody, that we're going to yes. trip over, that we're going to mm -hmm. fall, it's going to land us flat on our face. And it's going to contaminate the air. Exactly. And nothing will get accomplished. So mm -hmm. we can't sweep, like we didn't create this divide. The us and they divide existed since this country was founded. Exactly. And so I think, I think it becomes, I think it's hard for people to hear that though. I think it's mm -hmm. hard for people to hear like this black woman uh, connection that we have and not think that it's in a personal affront to mm -hmm. their, someone else's identity, to mm -hmm. white identity. Um, but, to, but yet to understand that I am earth. I'm, girl, I'm about mm -hmm. to use I am earth for girl. a long time. But like when I say, I think it's, um, for white people who think that way, I know that there are people of color and black people who think that way. Another thing, I, okay, can I just say this? I do not like the usage of people of color. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't. Call people who they are, you know, um, and if it's just going to be a long list of people that you're talking about, then that's on you. You know, if these institutional divides, if structural is racism and all of that stuff wasn't there, we wouldn't have to go down the list. But um, when people refer to me, particularly white people, like, you know, and as a woman of color, as a black woman, as yeah. an African American woman, call me who I am. Yes. Because I feel like people or persons of color, I don't think that it started off as anything negative, but I do feel like it well, just boxes us in. Yes. Yes. And it's more of us than it is white people. You still have this box of people, and white people are on the outside of that, you know? So there's that. But I realized that there are, you know, you know, people of other cultures who feel the same way. Um, but when white people say it to me, it's, it honestly, shit, even for those people, it might be a manifestation of white privilege. You know, it's a respect for white privilege. It's allowing white privilege to exist and persist, you know, to say, well, you know, we can't have these isolated conversations. We can't have these, you know, you can't have this affinity space for black people. You can't have this, you know, a uh, uh, dialogue that seems to perpetuate division, at least we can't have it publicly because it offends them. Well, it goes back to that fear you, you talked know? about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's all rooted in a sort of fear. And yep. in order to unlock that fear, we have to have conversations and we have to have uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. You have to be uncomfortable listening to two black women talk about they. Mm-hmm. And just because I think white people also need to understand that just because you are desensitized to, a, you know, your desensitization to a certain matter doesn't constitute that for other people. You know, we are newly evolving into what we hope will become a post-racial society. We are just now getting there. Unfortunately, go ahead, Cairo. Unfortunately, I think that this pandemic has played a part in that because ain't nobody exempt 
from this COVID-19 thing. Exactly. They try to make it black and white. And those numbers fluctuate like crazy. When you look at it on, um, at least uh, in our city, they fluctuate like crazy. And last time I looked, the, uh, the um, Hispanic population were much higher than everybody else. Nobody is exempt from this. Yeah. And it, and unfortunately, it's taken this level of calamity to like humanize our existence to certain groups of people. Um, you know, but, you know, altogether, Altogether, you know, like the need for these kinds of conversations, you know, like they persist despite other people in their insecurities, you know, altogether. So where do we go just to celebrate us? So they're mm -hmm. like, we just created a space where we can have this conversation and to celebrate our, who we are as Black women and affirm mm -hmm. one another. But like, where are there spaces that just affirm our, who we are as Black women, our accomplishments? Where, where do we go to just celebrate us? Mm -hmm. um, I think that Black people just have to do it anywhere. You know, I don't, necess I don't know that there will ever be a place where we can exclusively experience mm -hmm. that. And I wonder how much of our desire for that is, you know, perpetuated by, you know, white people having affinity spaces for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. you know, um, spaces that we couldn't enter for hundreds of years. And so I think naturally when the foundation is, you know, as such, the people on the receiving end of oppression emulate the oppressor to try to achieve whatever equality. Like, and I think, what you say? Liber Liberia, like I always think uh -huh. Liberia is that yes. example of, the oppressed becoming the oppressor. Yes, um, because that's what you learn to interpret as power. That's what you learn to interpret as freedom. You know, and so I think it's going to be important for, you know, Black people to unapologetically celebrate who they are everywhere. That they are, you know, and, and it's hard, um, you know, especially when we don't control the money, but it's imperative and it's key in humanizing us as a culture. You know, we, we can't keep allowing, you know, ourselves to be silenced. Um, I think that we also need to be upfront about cultural appropriation. You know, uh, lately it's been like this kind of trending topic of white women <clears throat> referring to themselves as queens and sister and, you know, stuff like that. And I was talking to some friends of mine about it and they was like, why do I feel some type of way about them calling themselves queens, you know? And we really have to think about it. Like, you know, cause maybe they are queens in their own right. You know, I think that what makes it uh, insulting is that it's clearly something that's borrowed. And at no point did any one of them say, you know what, watching black women embrace their inner royalty really inspired me to understand that for Fight myself. Fight a sister. Yes, like exactly, Fight a sister. Like don't come, don't borrow our cultural things and then go out into the world as if it's something that you came up on your own. And, you know, I think that a part of celebrating Blackness comes with that level of accountability. Like, you know, what's up, girl? Certain things that we say or whatever the case may be, certain things that we wear, I'm thankful that you appreciate braids and that you want some in your head. But what you can't do is project it, one, like you're doing it better than us, and then too, like it's something that you came up with on your own. Yep. You know, um, we watched a video of this white woman doing sewing weaves and she did a great job, um, but she was calling it the, I'll just say her name was Kristen. You know, I don't remember what her name is, but she, would, she was calling it the Kristen method. So black women are like sounding off, like, excuse me, that is a sewing. Yes. Yes. And yeah, it looks good or whatever. Or any other name. This is something, we, we're watching a video thinking she about to do some form of weaving that we've never seen before. Because white women wear weave too, contrary to popular belief. And so we're like, you know, well, maybe she's going to do a different type of weaving. And she was doing a regular cornrows sew-in with the leave out at the front, calling it her method. And um, white women were feeling like, you know, white women on the post at least were feeling like you know well black women why are you taking this so personally and we're like because this is not okay yes. like what if we took something from your culture 
and we have the finances and the influence to project it across the world as something that we came up with. And this is historically an exactly, issue. Exactly, exactly. It goes back to taking ownership of something mm -hmm. that is mine. Yes. And this idea of ownership. I think we have to be really, as a society, we have to be really careful and cognizant mm -hmm. of um, just the way we move and interact with each other, just on the base that some of us were property. Mm -hmm. And we can't, yep. we can't lose sight of that with our words, with mm -hmm. our actions and how we communicate and how we interact. Because again, that trauma is in my DNA. Come and on. So if you don't think about that, you're telling me that you don't value me. Mm -hmm. And we can even take it back like even a little, you know, just post like we can go back like civil rights or you know like back to the 50s and you know we go to cadillac records when yeah. people producing amazing songs we go to elvis presley yes you yes. know where these black people are writing and producing yes. beautiful music yes. and their images are not you know on the covers of their albums yes. you know representations of them are not there um i remember watching you know and then assimilation hurts when other people are acculturating, you know, are, you know, appropriating your culture. I watched a uh, video of Marvin Gaye, I love music. I watched a video of Marvin Gaye performing, I don't even remember which song it was, but he performed the same song twice. He performed it at Soul Train, I believe. And you know, he doing his thing, you know how he gonna do, he gonna be how he gonna be. Yes. But um, he performed it also for a white audience and it was a whole different Marvin on the stage. Mm. It was this very, is he suited up? You know, black people, when they sing, they got, ah, you yeah. know, kick off their shoes yeah. and, you know, right? You know, they, they feel it through their entire body, but it was just this very restrained version of him singing this song that white people love, but they can only take a piece of who he is. They'll appropriate him only so far, yeah. you know, for whatever it is that their benefit is. And I think that white people, you know, they have to be cognizant of that. You know, they have to be cognizant of that resistance to ownership. It yes. manifests and in so many that, I, that acceptance is something that I need from you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that's... As a human being. Yes, exactly. As a human being. You know, I also think that it's something to uh, them needing to understand that you can, you can borrow from other cultures without stealing identity. You can borrow without stuff. I cook tacos all the time. But you're and not I would not even food. begin. Yeah. My thing is, I wouldn't even begin to think my tacos was better exactly. than any Latina woman yes. who got up in the kitchen. You know, it's like I, I borrow things from, you know, several cultures and I would not begin to try to take it as my own identity. Yeah, I would not begin to try to drain that culture of its identity. And I think that that's something that white America struggles with. Girl, you have dropped so much knowledge. Okay, I got some <laughs> rapid fire questions for you okay. before we go get into the hour long talk category. Um, so what are you reading or what do you suggest that we, sh we be reading right now? Mm. Uh, where is it? It's in my room. Um, I am reading Black Banks and the racial wealth gap. It is, it's been a long read for me. Um, I've also paused and read some other books, um, but that black banks and the racial wealth gap is something that, that and white fragility is something that I think that all Americans need to read. Um, well, the book. With white fragility right now. I'm Girl. struggling because I feel like Robin DiAngelo is, I think, I feel like Cita Sister too. Like I feel like that work is preceded by some amazing black women mm -hmm. like like um audrey lord i feel like there's yep. so, so much that precedes that and people run to white fragility and i understand mm -hmm. maybe there's a comfort level in that but also i think we got to talk about like where from from where that comes from too yes mm -hmm. for sure one of the things i appreciated about it though is that she does not pacify white people anymore. yes no she, um she, you know, and then I also have had to look at it and be like, this book is not for me. Because there's certain things I'm like, oh, you forgot to say, but, <laughs> and another thing, yeah. but, you know, um, but it's not for me. It's for her and it's for her people. Um, you know, so I definitely like value the read in more than anything, it provided confirmation that white people do know. 
I think I got tired of, it got to a point where I wore an unapologetically black teacher shirt to school one time. And, um, you know, one of my white coworkers was like, what exactly does that mean? And I was like, figure it out. Google. It literally got to a point with white people pretending that they don't know that it was just like, hey, if you don't know, then I can't, I can't teach it to you. I don't even have it in me right now. I can't, I've had to tell coworkers, uh, one time we were talking about Michael Vick and apparently the conversation stuck with her and she like emailed me about it. Like, and I'm a dog lover. So what do you did to those dogs? I signed the petition because of these dogs. And I was like, girl, I'm gonna tell you right now. I can't even have this conversation without being condescending right now. So I think that you should find another black friend to talk about it with because I, I, I cannot find it in myself to respectfully rationalize why the life and fortune of a black man is more important than the life of a dog. Mm. Like, I, I can't, I just, I can't do this with you. And right that's okay now. for you. And, and, and respect me and know that that's okay for me to say mm -hmm. that. That I have every right and responsibility. And yes, to look, girl, yeah, I, I can't do this with you right that. now. Yep. Um, but the Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, Gap book is one that I highly recommend because um, I would also say that that was also instrumental in me departing from certain longings of this world because certain things that I just didn't put two and two together. It's a lot of history that I knew, and it's, but it's a lot of history that I didn't connect. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's another thing. We learn history in these bullet-pointed fashions. And we don't necessarily connect the dots over time. Um, so one of the things that really stuck out to me was uh, trades and licensures. And you know, the you know, we all know that Black people came off the plantations with uh, incredible skill set when it came to you know farming, when it came to mechanics, or you know whatever. And they come with this skill set. They're trying to integrate into society as free people, and so they sell what they do. Licensures. And, you know, things like that, they, they didn't begin until Black people were bartering their services. Mm -hmm. And it really made me look at so many things like, why am I paying? Why am I paying you? Why do I need a piece of paper to verify that I can use a skill that I'm gifted with? Why does my local cosmetologist need a license? She just know how to do hair. That's her thing. That's her skill set. You know, why does the local mechanic need a license for something that they're gifted right it's to yeah. it's mixed. and looking at things like that uh another thing that stuck out to me in that book was the credit scores in mind you these chapters are much longer but these are just little things that popped out at me uh credit scores and things like that credit scores were not a thing until black people got free and it's literally used to stop certain people from having access to certain things particularly black people my 675 credit score under my black social security number does not get the same benefits as 675 under Sally's social security number. You know, and so like seeing things like how they came up with, uh, you know, credit scores, seeing things like, you know, uh, the housing markets and things like that, and them refusing to fund black banks so that they can give out home loans and like the crashing of black banks and things like that. It, it was just, it's heartbreaking. It's a heavy read. That's a part of why it's taking so long for me to finish because I'd be having to, because I'd be walking around looking at everybody like, <laughs> you know, quarantine. everybody would be getting the mama look, right? <laughs> and so, you know, um, I think it's a beautiful story. I think it's a beautiful text, um, but, but it's heavy. So, so that I will say it's heavy. Another book I recommend is The Fire Next Time by James yeah. Baldwin. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The Fire Next Time. I, I mean, I just thought it was beautiful. It was great to explore his religious journey with him. Yes. And it's so identical to so many African Americans. I it's just like think, a love story to us. It's like this story yes. to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on the white end of things, um, my favorite white person is Benjamin Franklin, my favorite white person in history. Um, and so I would, it's a quick read, The Way to Wealth by Benjamin Franklin. Mm. Okay. I think it's so awesome. Um, you can read it in multiple ways, um, but to me, it's a lot of uh, insight into the mentality that keeps the rich rich and the poor poor. You know, but it's presented as I'm gonna tell you how to get rich. Yeah. You know, yeah. but the reality of it is, 
that I'm actually telling you how we stay rich. Yeah. Not how to get there, but how we stay there, you know? So those are my top three cool. right That's now. Well, I'm glad. Okay. So what is something you want to unlearn? Something that I want to unlearn. To unlearn. It's a good question. I want to unlearn hatred. Mm. Um, I'm making a lot of progress spiritually. Um, and love is a forever journey for me. And um, when you learn so much about people in the ways that, you know, in our own minds, we pit ourselves against each other and so on and so on. Honestly, it's a struggle to love. I struggle with loving white people. Um, I can be compassionate toward them um, and I can be kind and I can engage them without being mean or anything like that. But, um, you know, the more that I know and then the more that I see as I grow, the older my son gets, is certain things are still happening. You know, um, I struggle with that. I struggle with um, unconditional love and like loving them with the love of God. And so if there was anything in particular that I would want to unlearn, I would want to unlearn hatred. Thank you for, you were just really honest there and I appreciate that. Girl. What's your hope for the world? My hope for the world is, I got a lot of hopes for the world. Let me see what my biggest one is though. Uh, my hope for the world is wholeness for every single human being. Hmm. I want every single human being to be able to live in the full capacity, the maximum version of who they are, experience every dynamic of themselves, because I think that that's what will teach them to love other people. Like when you can explore yourself from the lowest to the highest, you know, I think that that's what enables you to look at other people and be like, let me love this person. So, um, yeah, I think that that would be my hope. And I think that's why I care so much about character education, because I think it's a, you know, I think it's a pathway yeah. to wholeness. I do too. When you said that, that's what it made me think of, like mm -hmm. your, the nine um, pillars of, of she where do we as black women go from here so you know we just had kamala harris uh indian mm -hmm. black american woman um on a vice presidential ticket and yet the mayor of virginia called her aunt jemima and people mm -hmm. are questioning her birthright where do black women um go in a society that still devalues them mm -hmm. um as a black woman, I've learned to perceive being so disregarded and under the radar as a privilege, because for me, it also means that ain't nobody really fucking with you. Like all they said, all they doing is saying, 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 everything is very mental. Everything is very like, you know, verbal. So I think that uh, black women need to go to their God and black women need to go to themselves you know, and make sure that they stay grounded because we know that one, at this point, we know that once we leave our house, once the world lays eyes on us, it's all daggers, you know? And so with that in mind, um, we need to go inside, mm. you know, we need to go inside and grab on to what centers us and take it everywhere that we go. Don't let nobody take you off your square because I just don't see that changing anytime soon, you know, um, and value, you know, find the value. It's, it, I don't even want to say that, but I am. So find the value, find the value in being so disregarded because I think that us being under the radar for so long is a part of why we are as prosperous as we are. Why because y'all because like why you over here thinking that I'm stupid why you over here thinking that I ain't nothing but my body why you over here you know reducing me to the lowest level of low that you possibly can you I'm know a, we're the highest group of graduating yeah. you know college students in the country we're about to be the vice president of the United States before any white woman ever passed 
you know, before any other woman ever has. You know, we're going to, because you are so busy undermining me, because you're so busy ignoring the power that is inside of me, as long as I'm centered, I'm a move. And before you know it, it'll all be mine. Wow. How can people reach you if they want to know more about she or if they want Dominica to speak um, at their conferences on their mail? Like, Hell no, that girl gonna say anything. No. <laughs> um, uh, you guys can reach me by email at uh, dwashington at shechicago.org. Um, you can visit shechicago.org. Uh, we're on Facebook as She Strong, Humble, and Power. Um, my Facebook profile, Dominica Troy Washington. Um, we are also on LinkedIn by She Chicago, and we are on Instagram as underscore She Chicago. Dominica, you have dropped so many nuggets. Like for real, I'm gonna have to go back and watch this myself and take <laughs> thank some you and pull some stuff out. As always, the great teacher that you are, you have taught and untaught us some things that we necessarily needed to unlearn about the Black woman. So I am so humbled, sister, that you are in my presence and that I get to call you friend. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. I feel the same about you.